Hey guys, it's Mike G. You may know me on Instagram as Frito History. This is my first video on YouTube, so I'm very excited to be bringing you guys history in this format, and hopefully in the future I'll be doing very similar projects. Today, we'll be touring the Lost Chickasaw Bayou Battlefield. Now, why I chose Chickasaw Bayou to be my first video is because I felt it was a very underappreciated battlefield. A, it was the first thrust at Vicksburg, which will become a major, major theater in the American Civil War. And B, it was the first independent command of William T. Sherman. Many of the lessons he learned at Chickasaw Bayou is stuff that he carried with him throughout the rest of his military career. All that began here at Chickasaw Bayou. Another reason why I wanted to come out to dissect the Chickasaw Bayou battlefield was because here, my fourth great grandfather, Jean Theolin Landry, served at the 26th Louisiana Infantry. Now I can't go and focus on every single action on every single part of the field, so this video is going to be mostly focused on the 26th Louisiana and the soldiers that they were engaged with. And this is a great place for us to start our Chickasaw Bayou tour on Washington Street, the center of the Chickasaw Bayou battlefield, and it is here where the only marker for the Chickasaw Bayou battlefield is located. It was placed here in 1961 by the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. And there's a number of these highway markers located around the state. They are really cool. Uh, I love checking them out. But this right here is the only marking for the Battle of Chickasaw Bayou anywhere on the battlefield. As Grant was moving down the Central Mississippi Railroad in December of 1862, he sent William Tecumseh Sherman on his first independent command down the Mississippi River and up the Yazoo River to land and take Vicksburg from the north. Just after Christmas, Sherman's men land around Johnson's plantation on the Yazoo and march up a wagon road that runs parallel to the Chickasaw Bayou. They would be tasked with wading through the heavy swamps and funneling across the narrow bridges before assaulting Pemberton and Stephen Dill Lee's Confederates entrenched here on the Walnut Hills, across the street from this marker. It was here that the first assault for Vicksburg was met and it was here where Sherman learned that taking the Gibraltar of the Confederacy was going to be a bloodbath. Not much remains marking the Chickasaw battlefield today, as you see, except for this marker. And hopefully this video puts some interpretation of the Chickasaw Bayou battlefield up to kind of advocate to save this battlefield. It's still out here. The majority of it has not been developed over and you can still see it. Uh, you know, hopefully you can see this video and when you come out to Vicksburg, you go ahead and you see some of these sites and, you know, donate to, to the responsible sources to save the Chickasaw Bayou battlefield. Continue down Washington Street and turn right onto Haining Road and you'll find yourself here at this timber yard, which is across the street from the site of the Vicksburg racetrack, which would have been here during the Civil War. And you could still see remains of that racetrack back there today. Behind me, you can see the obelisk from the U.S. Navy Monument at Vicksburg National Military Park. On the road here in front of me, the 61st Tennessee Infantry was deployed in a line of battle. Right in front of them was a very dense line of abate, which would have been uh, chopped down and sharpened log, uh, communication wire to tangle up soldiers, any to, anything to kind of create a, uh, a barrier or an obstacle for the Union soldiers coming down here in this direction. The location where this dirt road meets the Yazoo River marks a spot where the 3rd Division of William Tecumseh Sherman's expeditionary force under Brigadier General George W. Morgan had disembarked prior to the Battle of Chickasaw Bayou. Earlier in December, Sherman and Grant had met at College Hill near Oxford, Mississippi, after the fall of the Rebel Line on the Tallahatchie River. From there, Grant decided that he would remain on the Central Mississippi Railroad and hold the main body of, Confeder of the Confederate District of Mississippi and East Louisiana in the area, while Sherman would return to Memphis and advance down the Mississippi and Yazoo Rivers to storm and take Vicksburg from the north. Earl Van Dorn's Holly Springs raid in mid-December sends Grant back to Tennessee and frees up the rebels in Grenada to reinforce the garrison in Vicksburg. On December 26, Morgan's division of Sherman's force landed here with another division landing at Johnson's plantation less than a mile west. From this location, Sherman disembarked his tin-clad the forest rose. It is here where he noticed the water lines on the trees above his head, and he realizes he's very limited in time to make this assault through the bayou 
towards the Walnut Hills just behind me. This field behind me is where George Morgan's division would have been encamped, and this road will be the same road that Union forces will march down during the Battle of Chickasaw Bayou. Today, we're going to be following the footsteps of Colonel John F. DeCourcy's brigade, which includes the 54th Indiana, the 22nd Kentucky, the 42nd Ohio, and DeCourcy's own 16th Ohio. DeCourcy begins his life in England, and at the age of 17, he enlists in the Royal Army. At the beginning of the Civil War, he lends his services to the Union Army and finds himself in the 16th Ohio. The Battle of Chickasaw Bayou right here, Colonel DeCourcy will find himself in command of an entire brigade that will find themselves in some of the fiercest fighting in the early struggles for Vicksburg. Today, we'll be following their footsteps. Where this dirt road turns and kind of touches the Chickasaw Bayou for the first time would have been the approximate location of Ann Lake's Cotton Gin. Now, approximately right here, the 26th Louisiana, the 46th Mississippi, and one battery of the 1st Mississippi Artillery would have been deployed facing that direction. Coming down the road would have been Colonel DeCourcy's brigade. Right here on December 26, 1862, the first shots of the Battle of Chickasaw Bayou were exchanged. The following account is of Corporal Theodore Wolbach of the 16th Ohio Infantry on the fighting at the Lake's Gin House. Quote, Saturday, we moved in larger force farther from the boat landing. Progress was slowed and attended with very little firing until about five o'clock in the evening when a furious musketry fire was opened on the 22nd Kentucky Infantry that was operating in the advance. The sudden onslaught confused the men slightly, but under the clear, sharp commands of Colonel DeCourcy, who was with them, they promptly dressed their line, and at the word of command, returned the fire, driving the enemy away. Ten of the Kentuckians were wounded, and one killed. After this sharp set, it was quiet for a while. The 16th stacked arms in a large turn field, near the edge of the road that ran along the Chickasaw Bayou. Across from us was the gloomy, vine-tangled forest. From the branches of the trees hung the gray Spanish moss in abundance. After an afternoon of fierce skirmishing in this location, the Confederates started falling back from this position to their main line behind me. Captain Crow's company of the 26th Louisiana will be the last Confederate soldiers to be engaged in this position. One of the men in those ranks is my fourth great-grandfather, Jean Theolin Landry. If you continue the main dirt road, which now runs parallel to the Chickasaw Bayou, You'll find yourself here where this other dirt road intersects it at this gate, which is the location of Ann Lake's plantation house, which served as the front line in the early stages of the Battle of Chickasaw Bayou, and also served as Sherman's headquarters during the main federal assault. Judge William Lake was a prominent Vicksburg resident. He had served in both U.S. Congress and the Mississippi House of Representatives before the war. While campaigning for the Confederate Congress in 1861, he was killed in a duel with Colonel Henry Chambers in Memphis, Tennessee. After his death, the lake's property named Lakemont in downtown Vicksburg and the plantation here at Chickasaw Bayou were both run by his widow named Ann Lake. During the battle, the 26th Louisiana fell back from Lake's gin house to her plantation right here. And on December 27th, the 17th Louisiana had relieved them. On December 28th, the 26th and the 17th both took part in repulsing two batteries of Colonel Lionel Sheldon's brigade right here. The batteries would have been coming up from that direction on a uh, slight little rise in the land. And it is here where uh, the 26th and 17th Louisiana would fall back to the main pits at the Walnut Hills behind me. Sherman would later occupy this house and would set it up as his headquarters during the 20 December 29th assault. Winchester Hall will note of this place. The regiment early in the morning was posted in rifle pits about 500 yards in advance of our main line. The 17th Louisiana under Colonel Richardson had bivouacked in front of us and were soon engaged in a hot skirmish with the enemy. I sent our Captain Bateman out with his Captain Schaefer companies to deploy in a piece of woods to our right and skirmish with the left and flank of the enemy. Bateman's detachment was met by Colonel Withers then ranking officer in the front, who varied my order and directed Bateman to proceed at the double quick and flank the enemy. Bateman soon found himself confronted by artillery and three regiments of infantry, shot and shell and volleys of musketry 
soon compelled him to retire. There was now nothing between the enemy and the 26th, and on they came. I passed near each company and spoke to each a few words, cheered. The shelling was kept up and the mini balls soon began to whistle about us. But as the firing was under cover of woods which came to within 200 yards of our pits, we could have only had the occasional glimpses of a moving body. Therefore, fired sparingly. The enemy, well under cover of, of the woods, maintained their shelling and musketry during the, the, during the day. There was a wagon road from the Yazoo running up through our pits. The enemy ran a battery up this road to within about 400 yards of our line and in plain view. About time the guns were unlimbered and we, and we peppered them so hotly that they retired hastily without favoring us a single shot. And those, the brigade that, or the battery that is mentioned here is the 7th Michigan Artillery and the 1st Wisconsin Artillery overcoming in that direction. So if you had followed the wagon road in 1862, you would have crossed the Chickasaw Bayou at this location. Today, a paved road kind of follows the Chickasaw Bayou in a big bend, which leads back to this spot. This modern causeway, though, would have been the location of the Corduroy Bridge, which was an improvised bridge during the Battle of Chickasaw Bayou. On the night of December 28, 1862, the 17th and 26th Louisiana Infantries had fallen back from their main positions around the Ann Lake House to a series of rifle pits on the opposite side of the Chickasaw Bayou in front of the main rebel line at the base of the Walnut Hills, passing through this location on the way. After days of vicious fighting for every inch of the swampland, all that lay between Sherman's expeditionary force and the Confederate line was the Chickasaw Bayou and a heavy abate. The next morning, Sherman launched the long-awaited assault with the hopes of breaking through and continuing on to Vicksburg. Morgan L. Smith's division was launched as a diversionary force on the center as George W. Morgan's division would strike the right of the southern positions. De Corsi's brigade of Morgan's division had been on the front lines throughout most of the battle and was tasked with continuing down the main wagon road and over the bayou via this corduroy bridge before charging the, re the rebel line entrenched on those imposing hills. Simultaneously, a fresh brigade under Francis Blair of Steele's division would charge Pemberton's line adjacent to De Corsi on the other side of the bayou. Back here at the corduroy bridge, the 54th Indiana and the 16th Ohio were the first two regiments to be funneled across the bridge, and they did so under heavy fire. Once on the other side of the bayou, survivors would attempt to have to charge through an area of thicket and fallen timber known as the Bloody Triangle, before reaching the first rifle pits occupied by the 17th Louisiana, 26th Louisiana, 3rd Tennessee, and 62nd Tennessee, positioned in a kind of semicircle. Uh, you can think of it very similar to Pickett's Charge, how the Union would have been positioned on the top of Cemetery Ridge there. The Corduroy Bridge site survives to this day and is here right now, marked by this modern causeway, giving you a perfect visual representation of what the bridge would have looked like, how thick it would have been, and where these men would have had to been funneled across before charging the Walnut Hills in front of me. The topography of a battlefield is extremely important. Here at Chickasaw Bayou, the geography forced Sherman to funnel his men across the bayou at thin crossings. This is a big reason why there was such a bloodletting here at the Battle of the Walnut Hills. The following is an account from Private Frank Mason of the 42nd Ohio Infantry, De Corsi's Brigade. Quote, the road by which De Corsi's Brigade was to advance was a mere path through the woods, entirely obliterated by the fallen trees. Where this path struck the farther bayou, it turned abruptly to its left, followed the edge of the water about 12 rods, then turning sharply to the front, crossed the bayou on a rough log bridge or causeway about 10 feet in width, to the solid ground which sloped upward and forward to the base of the bluff. The whole distance from the starting point of the storming columns to the first trenches of the enemy was perhaps three-fifths of a mile. At a given signal, the batteries of Morgan and Smith posted along the first bayou opened simultaneously, working as rapidly as possible to keep the, down the enemy's fire. At the same moment, the two assaulting brigades started forward, 
each crossing on its narrow and frail bridge under the muzzle of the Union guns and advancing across the slashed timber. The enemy opened fire instantly and swept the whole valley with shells, shrapnel, canister, and musketry. Marching in close order, the men climbed logs and tore through the treetops, pushing forward as best they might. The three leading regiments had executed the flank march along the bayou and crossed the narrow bridge. Reaching the solid ground beyond, they deployed in column of divisions and marched rapidly up the slope. The 42nd followed closely, but before it advanced 50 yards beyond the bridge, the leading regiments began to melt away under the constantly increasing fire. The proposed point of attack upon the bluff proved to be an interior interior of an arc or a semicircle, so that the storming brigade advanced found itself in the center of the converging fire. The column raked from batteries and rifle pits directly in front, the divisions enfilading from either side by cannon posted at each extremity of the crescent. If you continue down the street and turn left at Fox Steel Road, you'll find yourself here at the base of the Walnut Hills is approximately this location where the 26th Louisiana would have fallen back into advance pits on the night of December 28th. This location is the approximate center of the Confederate semicircle at the base of the Walnut Hills. And this location right here, this flat ground in front of me, would later be named the Bloody Triangle. The morning of December 29th began with a massive artillery barrage on Pemberton and Stephen Lee's Confederates entrenched on the Chickasaw Bluffs in front of me. At noon, Sherman's infantry began their assault. The Confederate right, occupied by the 17th and 26th Louisiana Infantries, became the focal point of this charge, with Colonel John DeCourcy's brigade attempting to bottleneck across the Corduroy Bridge and Brigadier General Flan Francis Blair's brigade wading across the Chickasaw Bayou. The bluecoats were slowed by the thick swamps and dense abate in front of the rebel trenches. The 26th and 17th Louisiana viciously repulsed the few surviving men who had made it across the bayou into the bloody triangle here. Afterwards, Stephen Lee ordered the 26th and 17th to countercharge and take prisoners. Many of the Louisianians in high spirit disobeyed the orders and fired on the fleeing Yankees. While we were so engaged, General Lee and staff, the main body of troops with their officers, and the citizens of Vicksburg, including many ladies, were on the bluffs to our rear, where they could see every shot fired by us, and our flag, which had 40 bullet holes made in it that day, defiantly floating over our works. In the early part of the day, there was a comparative quiet. Our line of battle ran in a nearly straight direction at the foot of a range of hills where we had shallow rifle pits with two batteries, all covering the substantially open ground that the enemy had across in order to reach us. About 9 a.m., we could perceive considerable stir, indicating a general assault, and at 10 a.m., their line was formed. A terrific storm of shot and shell now burst upon us, and in its fury, it seemed as if no living thing about us could escape. When at its height, I cried out at the highest pitch of my voice, that's the music. Under cover of shot and shell, the enemy advanced with a force quite sufficient to carry our weak lines for the men in the pits were in single file, and we had no reserve force. Artillery and infantry on both sides soon became hotly engaged. The enemy's line continued to advance, although every weapon on our side was warm and every man was doing his best. Some approached to within 50 yards of our line, but it was their last assault. Soon the line wavers and breaks and confusedly attempts to retire. General Lee directed us to move in the open ground in front of our line and secure whatever prisoners we could. We had hardly started when the command reached a point where a body of the enemy was in full view only a hundred yards away. The temptation was too great for the naughty boys. They stopped without orders and savagely peppered the bluecoats. I thought it best to let them have their own way for a while as if part of the program of the occasion, as I feared they might not respond to an order to move with their usual subordination. I waited a while, and when the enemy had got well out of the way, I gave the order to cease firing and to march, which was readily obeyed, perhaps in view of the fact that none of their opponents were visible at that point. End quote. After Colonel Hall had ordered to cease firing, there was a sergeant in Company A who had continued to shoot into his front, 
At that point, Colonel Hall rode up to him and, quote, gave him a smart ramp on the back with the flat side of my sword. He turned around to look where the blow came from, and when he saw me, he seemed as much astonished as if a shell had stung him. I went in front, ordered the column into line, cocked my revolver, and said I would shoot the first man that would fire. In order to quiet them, I put them through the manual of arms, in plain view and entirely exposed to the enemy, most of whom had sought cover in the woods, where their batteries were not over 400 yards distant, although the sharpshooters were much nearer. The line went through exercises as if on parade. At dark, a picket was detailed from our regiment. I posted them about 300 yards in front of our lines and not over 200 yards from the line of woods where the enemy lay. His dead and wounded were all about us. Many of the wounded begged for water. I ordered water given to them and their canteens filled." End quote. General Lee rode up in front and said, quote, I thank the 26th for its distinguished gallantry. I thank it for its endurance in the trenches. Hereafter, I shall know that wherever they are placed, they will remain until ordered to leave. I wish you now to return to your tents and make yourselves comfortable so that when your services are again required, you will be ready, End quote. I said, quote, three cheers for General Lee, the hero of Chickasaw Bayou, End quote. Right here where the Chickasaw Road meets Washington Street is the very heart of the Chickasaw Bayou battlefield. It's the center of the bloody triangle. And the American Battlefield Trust has recently purchased property here to hopefully add some interpretation. This goes to show you that this is not a losing fight. This is not lost yet. We can go back, we could save Chickasaw Bayou Battlefield and hopefully have it preserved for future generations. So I'm on the extreme right of the Chickasaw Bayou Battlefield. Behind me at Thompson Lake, one company of the 26th Louisiana Infantry under Louis Guion will be ordered to help repulse Union soldiers coming down Thompson Lake. If you continue down Washington Street and turn right onto Kings Crossing Boulevard, you'll find yourself at the very end of the street here at private property where you can see this thicket of trees, which is a Indian mount, actually. Uh, it was built by the Natchez Native Americans before the Civil War and was here during the Chickasaw Bayou Battle. During the main federal assault on December 29th, the Confederates would deploy one battery from Company E of the Mississippi Light Art of the 1st Mississippi Light Artillery on the top of that Indian mound to repulse the Union soldiers charging the center of the Confederate line at the Chickasaw Bayou in front of me here. The 52nd Georgia and the 31st Louisiana will be deployed right here in front of the Indian Mound. And right in front of them is the Chickasaw Bayou and a crossing uh, that's kind of a sandbar known as the Sand Spit. Uh, Sherman will focus a diversionary assault here during the May or during the December 29th assaults. And if you want to continue your Chickasaw Bayou tour, you can come into the city of Vicksburg itself to the Balfour House here at the corner of Crawford and Cherry Street. And it is here, where on the night of December 24th, 1862, a huge Christmas Eve ball was being held in the Balfour House. That ball was interrupted when a Confederate private ran up the street and knocked on the door, announcing the arrival of Sherman's fleet moving down the Yazoo River. And a short drive from Chickasaw Bayou is the Vicksburg National Military Park, where the 26th Louisiana Infantry have their own monument in the same rifle pit that they held up in during the siege. This is just left of the Stockade Redan. And in this same rifle pit is this monument to Louis Guion. Louis Guion is the son of a sugar planter and the grandson of a Revolutionary War officer who held a commission from George Washington. Guion's gonna be a graduate of the University of Mississippi and the University of Virginia before the Civil War. 
and on the outbreak of the war, he enlists in the 1st Louisiana Infantry Regiment. He'll be sent back to Louisiana upon the death of his father to help deal with the property. And it's also while he's home where he helps raise the 26th Louisiana. During the Battle of Chickasaw Bayou, Louis Guion will uh, command his own company known as Guion's Cadets, and they're going to be deployed over by Thompson Lake. Uh, during the Siege of Vicksburg, Louis Guion is going to be an acting Inspector General of Shoup's Louisiana Brigade. And his monument is right here in the same pit. Among the other regiments that have monuments here at Vicksburg National Military Park is the 16th Ohio Infantry. These guys were some, one of the first regiments to deploy across the Corduroy Bridge, and their monument is located right here across the street from the Iowa Monument. And if you park up at Fort Hill at the Vicksburg National Military Park, and you look in that direction, that's the Chickasaw Bayou Battlefield. It's the old Yazoo River right there. Sherman will advance this direction towards the Walnut Hills, which extend that way. If you come to the Vicksburg National Cemetery, near the entrance there is this monument dedicated to Union soldiers who were captured during the Battle of Chickasaw Bayou and died as prisoners of war and are currently buried here. There are 44 known to name and the others known only to God. The Battle of Chickasaw Bayou is important, not just because of its role in Sherman's career, and not just because of its role in the Vicksburg Campaign, but because on this ground, a Medal of Honor was earned. The Medal of Honor citation for James Alexander Williamson of the 4th Iowa Infantry reads, quote, led his regiment against a superior force, strongly entrenched, and held his ground when all support had been withdrawn, end quote. Coupled with the failed assaults at Fredericksburg and the Holly Springs Raid, the Battle of Chickasaw Bayou ends December of 1862 with an extremely sour note for the Union war effort. Despite having almost double the amount of troops, Sherman loses almost 2,000 at the assaults at Chickasaw Bayou. He gains no ground, and it still takes months until Vicksburg falls on December 3, 1863. Thank you guys so much for your support and for watching this video. Hopefully you enjoyed your tour of the Chickasaw Bayou Battlefield today. And next time you guys are in Vicksburg, definitely consider seeing the site for yourself. Also, please feel free to donate to the responsible organizations that I had mentioned in this video, such as the American Battlefield Trust, with their efforts to save the Chickasaw Bayou Battlefield. Like I had mentioned earlier, my name is Frito History on Instagram, so please check out that account. And be on the lookout here on YouTube for more videos similar to this. Thank you guys so much, and I really enjoy, hope you guys enjoyed your tour of the Chickasaw Bayou Battlefield.